Is a member of parliament the people's trustee? Is an MP disqualified from being an MP because he accepts remuneration from third parties? In my respectful view, this is the wrong question to ask. Why? My name is GK Gunnison and this is GK TV. What are an MP's legal duties? What can he not do? What happens if he breaches those duties? Let's start with the basics. You would agree with me that constitutional law is the subset of general law. Now we start with the proposition that under the general law, the MP is either responsible or is not responsible to the people. What do you think? The next question we should ask ourselves is, if an MP breaches the general law, what remedy like citizens like you have? So the first question is, who's a trustee and what are his or her duties? A trustee is in law known as a fiduciary. He is someone trusted to hold some interest, usually property or monies, for somebody else called a beneficiary. Now the thing is, he must act only in the best interest of the beneficiary. Fiduciary has a heavy responsibility. If he doesn't perform his duty, he is said to have acted in breach of duty. That means a fiduciary cannot be trusted. Pagar makan padi. He can be sued. Now, should an MP act in the best interest of the nation? Well, we start with this proposition. Do you have any idea what an MP swears to when he takes the oath of office? These are the words in the sixth schedule to Article 59. And he says these words, I, having been elected as a member of the House of Representatives, or the Senate, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge my duties as such to the best of my ability, that I will bear true allegiance and faith to who? To who? To Malaysia. And will preserve, protect and defend who? His party? No. The federal constitution. That is found in Article 59, subparagraph 1, and the federal constitution's sixth schedule. So, the next question is to what and to whom do MPs swear allegiance? MPs swear allegiance to the nation of Malaysia, not to their constituencies, and they swear to defend the constitution. The next principle that needs to be understood is the executive, that is to say the government is answerable to parliament and therefore every MP. Members of the executive, including the civil service and the cabinet, are answerable to parliament. So an MP is in law a superior to every member of the executive. If the cabinet or the civil service or even the MPs do not act within the law, then the MPs and all who breach the law can be called out by both the judiciary and in a larger sense, the people, you. But to whom does an MP answer? One question which has bothered me is this. What happens when an MP becomes a servant of his own servant? Suppose you are an MP. Suppose your servant owns or controls company A. And suppose your servant appoints you as a director of company A. Imagine this MP sitting as director of company A in parliament. Is it not true that the MP as director is company A's servant? So on the one hand, the MP has to act in the best interest of the nation. And on the other, he must act in the best interest of the company A. Company law requires it. He has no choice about it. So who is now the servant, the MP or his servant? Take another example. Suppose the government owns a certain portion of company A's shares. Any director of any company is always a trustee, always a fiduciary, the legal word fiduciary is very important, so important in fact that we shall continue to use it from now on. A fiduciary must act in the very best of the interest of the beneficiary, in this case company A. Suppose an MP sits as a director of a government control company. Under company law, the director of a company has a legal duty to fight for the well-being and profit of the company of which he is a director. The law is so strict that a director of company A must act to his own detriment 
so that he can advance the interest of company A. So to answer the question, are MPs the trustees of the people? Of course, the answer is yes. A principle of democracy is that a man who is elected into parliament is responsible and answerable to who? To the people of his constituency, to his nation and to the law. This is the intent behind Article 59 of the Federal Constitution. That's why when an MP takes the oath of allegiance, he swears allegiance to Malaysia and he swears to protect and defend the Federal Constitution, not Company A, not some NGO, not his political party. The MP also swears to protect the affairs of the entire nation. Now, consider this. Do you think an MP acts for free? An MP receives emoluments from Parliament. And where do these monies come from? They come from you because it's part of the tax. Now, suppose an MP works for Industry X, some industry, and he is a director of a company in Industry X. He appears and he argues in favour of that industry in Parliament. He doesn't care about the electorate. He doesn't care about the constituency. He doesn't care about the nation. In Parliament, all he does is to argue in favour of Industry X. He asks that factories making material acts be allowed to operate in residential areas. He fights for the industry. Now, would you be happy with such an MP? The next point we need to tackle is what is known as a conflict of interest. What if there is a conflict of interest between what company A wants and what the nation needs? Suppose the government owns or controls a large proportion of a company's shares. In sitting as a director of company A, an MP, who is technically the boss of the executive, that is to say the government, is getting paid by the government, his own servant. So what do you think? Will such an MP protect the national interest or fight for company A? It's not difficult to guess, is it? This principle was made obvious in a 1910 case called the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants. Now that case dealt with the UK Trade Unions Act. It had a very odd clause in it. One of the provisions of the act allowed a trade union to ask for contributions, money, from its members. And you know what these monies were used for? They were used to secure parliamentary representation. Now, there was a provision that it was the duty of every member of that union to advance the interest of the union, whether in parliament or elsewhere. The previous council was asked whether these clauses and the agreement that the MPs had made with the Labour Party were proper. And you know what the Privy Council said? It said that such rules were fundamentally illegal because these were in violation of sound policy which is essential for the working of a representative government. So if you represent a group of people, you must do your best for them because they voted for you, not some other group of people to whom you have to pay money or they pay you money and you have to advance their constitution. Sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? From a conflict of duty, we move on now to the concept of breach of duty. In 1963, there was a case called Bolting and another versus Association of Cinematograph, Television and Allied Technicians. I won't bore you with the details of that case except to tell you what principles came out of it. That case followed Amalgamated and it said, no fiduciary is allowed to enter into any engagement or agreement by which he can disregard his duties to his people. He cannot act inconsistently with his duties to his people. Suppose an MP should be in the pay of some outside body in return for which he binds himself to vote as he is directed by a third party to do. That agreement, said the Privy Council, be clearly void against public policy. Thus, if an MP doesn't exercise his duties for the benefit of the nation, he must therefore be considered as being in breach of his fiduciary duties. So, 
an MP acting in a way that's contrary to national interest, but in favor of a commercial entity or political entity controlled by a servant, must also be in breach of his fiduciary duty. The next question is, what does the law require fiduciaries to do? How should a fiduciary behave? What can a fiduciary do? What can he not do? Every law student knows the answer. Back in 1896, about 124 years ago, a judge called Lord Herschel said in a case called Bray versus Ford, a fiduciary, he meant a trustee, cannot make profit. He cannot put himself in a position where his interest and that of his duty conflict. This is because, said the judge, human nature being what it is, there is danger in such a situation of the fiduciary or the trustee being swayed by his own interest or that of his party rather than his duty to his people. In this way, said the judge, he endangers the person whom he was bound to protect. And who is that? That's you, ladies and gentlemen. So how do UK MPs declare their interests? In the UK, there are acts of parliament which require every member of parliament to disclose their respective financial interests when they become members of the House of Commons or afterwards when they acquire some new interest in any business venture. At the first available opportunity, they must register it. So when there is a debate in the House of Commons over the business activities of any business entity, members of parliament who have any interest in that business as a matter of honour, integrity and law must immediately declare their interest. If they fail to do that, any votes that they cast are discounted and disallowed. Let's deal with what a trustee cannot do. An old case called Boardman and Phipps says, a fiduciary cannot make secret profits. He cannot use his position of a trustee to make monies and keep it for himself. He has to give it to the beneficiary. He cannot act in breach of his duties to his beneficiary. He cannot put himself in a position of conflict. He cannot, if he comes by information that is sensitive, that relates to the trust. That's a case called Barrett versus Hartley. So let's apply the law here and see where it takes us. If an MP accepts a position for wages or remuneration while he's receiving parliamentary remuneration, unless this is allowed by statutory law, an act of parliament, and my small research shows no such law exists in this country, then he acts in breach of his duty as trustee. Okay. So what happens to an MP who breaches his fiduciary duties? All through last month, we've been hearing arguments about how an MP can become disqualified, counter arguments that a man can only become disqualified if he acts contrary to Article 48 of the Federal Constitution. And there's a whole gamut of technical arguments about that. I think, with respect, these arguments overlook the larger principle that a man who acts in breach of his duties as trustee is liable to be sued by any person in the community. And the real question is, can the common law disqualify an MP? So constitutional disqualification under Article 48 is not the only answer. That's only the tip of the iceberg. The first principle is, and the most obvious one, if an MP is a gentleman or a gentlewoman, then as a matter of honour, if there has been a breach of duty, he or she must resign. Now the principle of resignation as a matter of honour, exists. It is seriously practiced in all other civilized countries, Finland, Sweden, the West, Japan, Korea. But unfortunately, since 1971, not in Malaysia. Why is that? I have no idea. Is it possible that some people feel no sense of honour? They don't at all feel obliged to resign on a question of principle? I don't know. But there it is. My own small research shows that this principle of refusing to resign as a matter of honour began to rear its ugly head since the early 70s. It's not difficult to guess 
why it happened. Now the next possible relief is criminal misconduct. A man who acts in breach of trust breaches the criminal law, for example, section 409 of the penal code. Now the law says a man who is guilty of a crime and he sentenced to a fine of a thousand ringgit or imprisonment of a year or more is automatically disqualified from being an MP under article 48 paragraph 1. And again, he cannot under the election law stand for elections. But the real question is the third rule, a civil suit. But who can sue an MP? In my view, an MP can be sued in a civil action for breach of the law of trust. Take the story in 1987. As you know, Lim Kit Siang, a member of the DAP, was an MP and he sued a corporate entity called the United Engineers Malaysia Brahad for various reasons. He alleged that the government had awarded a privatization project to UEM and he wanted it declared void. He alleged that this was because it was improper and that the government had misconducted itself in the award of the project. He alleged corrupt practices. Now, what does the government do in that case? The government tries to strike him out. It fails. It comes up to the Supreme Court and the government argues that Kit Siang had no local standard to sue. The government argued he was neither a shareholder nor a director of UEM. Now, when the matter reached the Supreme Court, five judges heard the arguments and there was a split of opinion. Three judges ruled against Lim Kit Siang. They were the Lord President Tun Saleh Abbas, the Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Abdul Hamid and Mr. Justice Hashim Yob A. Sani. All three held that Lim had no right to sue. Now, two judges dissented. One was Mr. Justice George Sia, my favorite judge. He's one of the most honorable of the judges who had ever had the honor to walk the hallowed halls of the Malaysian judiciary. The other was the equally great and erudite Mr. Justice Yusuf Abdul Qadir. Both of them in a dissenting judgment ruled that not only had Lim the right to sue, but he had a positive duty to do that because being a member of parliament, he not only was responsible to the people of his own constituency, but also for the affairs of the whole nation. There the law remained until 1995, I think it was, when we saw a modern case develop. We see that in a 2014 series of cases, which held that any person could sue any other person in matters of public interest, so long as it was in the interest of the nation. That modern view was founded in a number of English cases. I cite two. One was the 1982 case of England Revenue Commissioners versus National Federation of Self-Employed and Small Businesses. The second one was R versus Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, Ex parte World Development Movement Limited. In Malaysia, that principle was received in a number of cases. I'll cite one famous case because you'll remember it. There was a body called Balkis. It was a body comprised of wives of assemblymen and MPs in Salango. The Salango government gave Balkis certain sums of monies. There was a change of government, I think it was in 2013, and the new state government demanded to have an account of when and where and how these monies were expended. Finding the need to answer these questions overly inconvenient, members of Balkis attempted to dissolve the company, but the state government challenged it. That ended up in a case called Krajan Nagri Slango and others versus Pandafta Pratubahan Malaysia in the year 2014. I think Mr. Salvaraja argued it on behalf of the government, but the lawyers for Balkis argued that the plaintiff had no right to sue. They cited the locus tendai argument in Lim Kit Siang, but the Court of Appeal, to its credit, disagreed. In fact, a number of cases in Malaysia have gone so far as to state that any taxpaying individual has a right to sue any other person in matters involving public interest. And in my respectful opinion, that includes MPs. The next principle that you need to be told is the fact that for hundreds of years, courts have asserted supervisory jurisdiction over trustees and the power to appoint or remove trustees. One example of that principle can be seen in the 2006 case of Aramugam Purnasamy against Karupaya Ramasamy. So, therefore, 
these MPs could be sued by anybody. Now, if a court is asked to declare an MP unfit to be, remain an MP or declare the MP to be in breach of his or her duties and proof is shown to that effect, what is there to stop a court from giving that order? I don't think there's anything to stop a court. Therefore, in conclusion, notwithstanding what I've said about the common law, I think we need a parliamentary act that stops MPs from breaching their fiduciary duties. Any breach of that duty, not only those listed in the constitution, but also those which deal with the general law, including the law of trust, should result in an immediate disqualification or dismissal. Secondly, our MPs need to ask themselves, they need to put their hands on their hearts and ask whether they've acted with honor, whether they've acted in the best interest of the country, whether they've acted in the best interest of every citizen of this country and whether they've acted, on the other hand, in their personal interest. Now, if an MP is in breach of his fiduciary duties, he or she should do the right thing, resign. Will our MPs act in honour or will they be led by their noses, by their party? That is the question. Ladies and gentlemen, this is GKTV. Thank you for being with me. If you like this video, could you please press like? Could you please also subscribe and ask your friends to subscribe? Could you please take this video and send it as far and wide as possible because we would want people to hear these principles and make their own decisions. Thank you very much. Have a good day.